Post-apocalyptic worlds have featured in games as far back as 1988's Wasteland, but the genre came into its own with Fallout, a series still running strong today and beloved by many. There's something about humanity's final, defiant struggle in a time when the very world has turned against them that appeals to people on a deep level, allowing the setting to endure as it's the perfect backdrop for survival against impossible odds. So what happens if you take those tropes, throw them away, and instead tell the story of a group of almost insane post-apocalyptic survivors defending a bar from deranged lunatics? My name is Gaudin, and I'm reviewing Steam games in alphabetical order to find the hidden gems among the piles of garbage, and today we're reviewing New The Beginning. Let's dive in. Released in 2022, New The Beginning is a point-and-click adventure game with light puzzle elements set in post-apocalyptic… well, it's never directly referenced, but given the developer, Jan, and the accents of the main characters, I think it's safe to assume this is set somewhere in Germany. Now, in case you missed the content warning at the beginning, please be aware that there will be foul language, graphic cartoon violence, sexual references, and drug references. It's basically impossible to do this game justice in a review without these things appearing on screen at some point. As always, we begin with the title screen and the settings menu, of which there isn't one. At least not any graphical settings, anyway. But interestingly, we do have voice acting in both English and German, a very nice touch. The voice acting is also completely optional, you can turn it off, but I would recommend playing with it on for the experience, as we'll discuss shortly. Before starting the game, we're asked, sure? And I'm not going to be too harsh, the devs have obviously done their best to translate the game into English, and I appreciate their efforts, but it's certainly an imperfect translation, but I can forgive that. What I am less forgiving of is the fact that the options aren't centred on the screen. Maybe it's meant to allude to the fact that this game is a bit off-centre itself, but I kind of doubt it. Upon beginning the game, we're shown a very short animated cutscene of the main character climbing down off something, the title card appears, and then we're into the first scene where the barkeep gives us a brief bit of backstory and presents us with an optional tutorial, and already there is a lot going on. Starting with the most noticeable, the art style. I'm not sure of the exact niche it falls into, but everything is hand-drawn, shaded, and animated, and to give them their due credit, the art is consistent throughout the game, with a lovely amount of detail. Even in this first scene, you'll see the stains from spilt drinks, broken bottles, the neon sign, don't look at it, a bird nest in the top left, various worn and peeling posters, and overgrown vegetation slowly reclaiming the abode. The characters themselves are drawn in a way that is reminiscent of shows like Salad Fingers. If you don't get that reference, it's probably for the best. You immediately get the sense that this is a run-down, grimy, grungy, and dirty world. We receive some context and backstory from the barkeep, who is never named, so they shall now be Gonzi. Gonzi explains that they found us outside and brought us in until we woke up. It's the year 2026, and humankind has survived a zombie apocalypse. Apparently it was kind of over once the zombies all decomposed, and now society is slowly rebuilding. Or in some cases, not really. There is a dangerous group nearby calling themselves the Survivors, who are drunk with power, and for an unknown reason are trying to find and kill Gonzi, and brutally murdering anyone that's in their way. In an effort to repay Gonzi for their kindness, the protagonist offers to help recruit some allies to defend the bar and keep them safe. Unfortunately, they've got amnesia and have no idea who they are, let alone where they are. So our protagonist for this adventure shall be Zest. All of this information is delivered to us through some questionable voice acting, or at least that's what I thought at first. Have a listen to this. Wait, I know you. Yeah. You were here a couple of times some years ago. And? Do you still have so many customers? I probably shouldn't have opened a bar in the woods. Well, true. But at least I'm safe here. What's interesting is that this is consistent throughout the game, possibly due to the limited number of voice actors they had access to. Having played through the entire game though, I choose to believe that this is intentional, as it adds to the surrealness of the entire experience, and combined with the art style and the character animations, it creates this persistent feeling of unease. Intentional or not, I think it's actually fantastic, and occasionally unintentionally humorous, but it absolutely could be off-putting for some people. 
One small complaint I have though is that it feels like Zest has a different voice in the opening few lines compared to the rest of the game. What time is it? Whoa, what happened to this guy? It initially feels much more rough and sounds deeper than it does at any other time, which is a bit odd. Controlling Zest is fairly basic, simply click to move. Holding down spacebar will show everything on screen that Zest can interact with and you can either left click to examine them or right click to interact with them. Zest also has a handy satchel that is used to carry things but it is frankly underutilised. You will never need to carry more than you could just hold in your hands. Backstory delivered, controls explained and the bar thoroughly examined, it's time to begin the journey and find some allies. And yes, that is how Zest walks. It's never explained, but it is referenced in conversation. Heading outside and up the stairs, Zest moonwalks over to the right and encounters the first group of somewhat traumatised looking people sitting huddled around an unlit campfire. The guy with the lighter, Willy Walter, wants to light the fire, but he hasn't got any sticks. Considering Zest just walked through some woods to get here, they offer to grab some, and once it's done, the girl on the right, Jenny, decides to be the first helper that joins to defend the bar. We're instantly transported back to the bar, and in a nice touch, Jenny is hanging out here now, and you can chat to her. Hello there. Hey friendo, gotta get some friends. She's... quirky. Most of the game plays out in a similar fashion, with Zest needing to perform relatively simple tasks to recruit more people to protect Gonzi in the bar. The world itself is… well, I wouldn't say it's lovely considering that at one point you walk through the aftermath of a massacre in a cabin, but it is interesting. Crossing the bridge and another section of woods, Zest stumbles upon the hideout of the survivors. After a short conversation with the guard, they reveal they're happy to let us pass if we can help them get some rest, preferably with a lady. It just so happens that on the way here, Zest passed by a Lady of the Night. The lady is unnamed, so will be called Lampyridae. They say they're willing to help, but they want to be able to defend themselves first and request a pistol. Luckily, there is a train nearby that Zest can use to access a gun shop, but we're informed by the blind train conductor that they need a train ticket first. Yeah, apparently there is an actual working train here, and the person driving it is blind. Yeah, I'm sure it's fine, it's on train tracks, there's only so much that could go wrong. Heading through the cabin, stopping briefly to grab a hammer and a golf club, as well as admire the paintings of a blue man and a slender man, we head into a small garden and find two more people. First is the ticket machine, a man taped to a tree behind a piece of plexiglass. And it's moments like these that the absurdist humour really shines. You can't help but wonder how long he's been there. Does he get paid? Probably not, considering we got the ticket for free. Does he get bathroom breaks? Also probably not. Then there is the drunk lady on a park bench. She's trying to sober up and offers to trade us the last of her whiskey for a bottle of water. Why do we want the whiskey? Well, for the same reason we wanted the golf club and the hammer, because if a point and click game allows you to collect something, you better take it. Zest heads back to the train and is allowed to board. Here there are several characters to interact with, including a drug consumer and two actual demons. No, it's not explained why the demons are there, or why they have a carton of corpses nearby, except that it might just be a way of keeping things relatively neat and tidy. Speaking to the conductor, because Zest has a ticket, they, and only they, are allowed to control where the train goes. So the first stop is the gun shop, and upon arriving we leave through the side door, and immediately fall several metres down. And what I love is that the ground here is barren, indicating that this happens pretty frequently. You can re-enter the train just fine by going up the stairs to the left, but if you want to leave the train at this stop, you'd better be prepared to jump. The shopkeeper looks like a demon, but claims they aren't. They do have a gun for sale, but it's $25 and Zest has exactly $0. So the next stop will be Central Station to see if we can find some money. Before leaving though, Zest interacts with a nearby skull, wondering if it's from a dead zombie. He's told that it was the shopkeeper's partner, who he killed because he tried to take his cookie. Was that a zombie? That was my partner. Oh, was he infected? Yeah, but that wasn't why I killed him. He ate my cookie. Oh damn. Well damn. Before heading to Central Station, Zest takes a detour to a local lake. 
Using a nearby fishing rod reels in quite a large catch, and using a hammer on it reveals that inside is a fully intact bottle of fresh water. Ah, video game logic. Never change. Down below we have a fisherman in what is probably the most intimidating and powerful fishing pose I've ever seen. They greet Zest and mention that they actually know each other from a few years back. Before Zest has a chance to ask any questions though, this happens. Um, can I help you? Not really, but I do think it's gonna be a big one. Whoa, what the fuck? You okay? Fuck! With nothing else to do at the lake, it's time to head to Central Station. Here, Zest finds a coffee shop. Or maybe it's a cafe. It's unclear, but it also really doesn't matter. There are several delightful and somewhat bloodied customers to interact with here, but as we're after money, we head into the back to speak to the manager. He's clearly one of the most well-off people here, given how smartly dressed and relatively clean he is. And as such, he immediately refers to Zest as bitch. But we're not trying to tell him off, considering that there is a book on his desk titled Kill List. Yet, yeah, not someone you want to get on the bad side of. He offers Zest a job, which we of course take. We can talk to the other server to get an idea of what they do, and they provide us with a mug with which to provide sweet, sweet caffeine to the waiting customers. Side note, I love that the coffee machine is powered by a hamster wheel. Coffee delivered, Zest returns for his pay. $57. For roughly 5 minutes of work, that's amazing. That works out to $684 per hour or $1.4 million per year. Either I'm in the wrong industry or inflation is very, very real in the post-apocalyptic world. Before leaving, we chat to the guy at the front in a white shirt. Their name is Philip and they need some drugs. Well, conveniently, we know a guy on the train that might be able to help. One short conversation and a very strange real life clip of smoking later, Philip is provided with the golf club from earlier and promises to help Gonzi and the bar. Cash in hand, Zest can also head back to the gun shop to purchase a pistol, which when tossed onto the counter ends up having an unfortunate typo, resulting in the T being missing. Zest takes this back to Lampyridae's and then happily informs the guard that she's waiting for him. The two then head off to the bar for some bedtime stories. No, I'm not kidding. The game plays an excerpt of a lady reading a book. Miss Birdie entered the classroom. Good morning, pupils, she said. Let's start the English lesson. Ella replies. But Miss Birdie, we have our math lesson now. Oh, really? Miss Birdie asks. Yes, everyone answers. Ella asks. What's the matter, Miss Birdie? Oh, well, she cries. Gilbert has stolen Rambo tonight. Did I mention that this game was strange and uses absurdist humor? Before heading back to the base, Zest makes a detour back to the garden with the ticket machine, who is still taped to the tree. I guess his shift isn't over yet. We give the lady the bottle of water that we found in the fish, and she allows us to take the bottle of whisky. We can now enter the base of the survivors, and upon sneaking in, we overhear them talking about how their boss is missing. The newest and most normal looking recruit, Sven, is tasked with retrieving the boss and bringing them back. Sven spots Zest and beckons him over, blackmailing us into finding the survivor's boss for him. Otherwise, he'll tell the group that we overheard everything. Thankfully, he knows where the boss will be, which is back at the coffee shop. Heading on back, we find him in the corner near the coffee machine. He doesn't actually have a name, so we'll call him Master Vane. After some rather awkward introductions, he mentions that he tasked the survivors with hunting Gonzi simply to keep them busy. Without a common task, it seems they don't get along too well. The last time James was left alone with Color, he literally cut his face off. Color is somehow still alive and wears the skin of his face like a mask, and James now spends most of his time tied to a board, unable to move. The third member, Cloyes, is uninjured, but also very unhinged, and is the most violent of the group. So Master Vane was simply trying to keep them busy for a bit and get some time alone to enjoy a drink. He's not a fan of hearing that they are killing innocents and agrees to work with Sven to protect Gonzi and the bar, but only after he's had another Irish whiskey. How convenient! Whiskey provided, we head back to the survivor camp to inform Sven of the change of plans. Rather than just give a brief explanation, we're treated to another real life clip. I'm not sure I understand the point of these immersion breaking clips, but I have two guesses. 
Either the dev wanted to build on the absurdism themes with fourth wall breaks, or the dev didn't know what to say or how to animate certain scenes, so found a workaround. Now, we're almost at the end of the game and all that's left to do is head back to the bar for one last chat with everyone. If this game and its story has managed to pique your curiosity sufficiently, feel free to jump to the timecode on screen to avoid some pretty major spoilers. For those staying, this is your final graphic violence content warning. After returning to the bar, Gonzi asks us to grab some barricades from outside. Before doing so, you can chat with Gonzi, Master Vane, the guard and Lampyridae's, Philip, Jenny and Sven, who is doing some warm up yoga in the corner. When Zest heads outside, he's ambushed by Color, Cloys and James, and after a brief conversation, knocked unconscious. The aftermath of the combat is shown in a short cutscene. Gonzi, Master Vane, the guard, Lampyridae's, and even poor Sven have all been brutally murdered. Philip and Jenny manage to escape in a conveniently never before mentioned car, taking the unconscious Zest with them. After a brief conversation in the car, they're forced to stop for fuel. In a nice touch, the pair are clearly emotionally affected by the recent events. They are forced to use the last of Zest's money for fuel, which just happens to be exactly the right amount. Back on the road, the two discuss what to do next, with Jenny mentioning that revenge might not be a bad idea. They're interrupted by a run-in with a squirrel, which turns out to be just pretending to be dead, when Jenny bumps into Carla, who has been abandoned by Cloys and James. Kala follows Jenny over to Philip, who is then joined by the now awake and somehow outside the car, Zest. Kala explains that he was abandoned because he was telling Cloys and James to stop chasing the trio and is now on his own and defenseless. And here, New the Beginning gives you your first meaningful choice. You can either recruit Kala or simply kill him. If you choose to kill him, a short real life cutscene of Jenny moving to choke Colour to death will play and she is clearly traumatised after the event. If you spare him, Colour joins the crew for the next section of the car ride. Either choice will result in you arriving at a small hippie camp. Zest's memory plays up once again, causing him to miss Philip and Jenny's attempts to get information from the group, which is led by a joint smoking priest and his entourage of believers. In case it wasn't clear, this is a cult. A cult that apparently Philip used to be part of before he was excommunicated and now they won't talk to him. Luckily, they are open to talking to Zest and he is told that in order for them to be willing to share information, he needs to prove he is trustworthy. Zest can do this by either killing Philip or convincing Color or Jenny to join the group. Funnily enough, Philip isn't too keen on dying, so it's option two. If you spared Color, you can ask him to join the cult or if you chose to kill him, you can ask Jenny. Either choice results in the same outcome, a short conversation followed by the reveal that the survivors are here. A fact we already knew given that we could see their car. James was slightly off screen to the left and Cloyes was in the toilet the entire time. Unfortunately for them, James is still tied up and Cloyes is weaponless, whereas Philip had the presence of mind to keep his golf club on hand. We're now given a second choice, to kill or spare James. Whichever you choose will also apply to Cloys. they either both die or both live. Either way, the trio then make their escape, leaving Colour behind if he was still alive. If you had decided to kill anyone, the trio are branded as the new survivors and their choices and desire for revenge lead them to be just as destructive as the original survivors. If you let everyone live, the trio set off and try to help Zest recover his memory. Either way, you're now treated to an almost three and a half minute long credit sequence before being dumped unceremoniously back at the title screen. Well damn. New The Beginning is a curious game. It's a contradiction of sorts. Mechanically sound, but bare bones. It's beautifully ugly. This kind of game and humour certainly isn't for everyone, but there will be people that absolutely adore this game. There is real love and care put into it, even if it's not your cup of tea. I spent the majority of my playthrough with mixed emotions, confusion, bewilderment, disgust, laughter, intrigue, concern, but more often than not, what I felt was curiosity. I wanted to know what was coming next. What was the next curveball the dev would throw in? How would they keep up the surrealism without reusing ideas? 
And to the devs' credit, I think they had a vision and successfully delivered it, quirks and all. It's certainly not a product without flaws. The menus are clunky, there's a moment where the game cuts from one scene to the next as though content was removed, and there are translation errors all over the place. I think this needs to be treated less like a game and more like a piece of art. If you play without a guide, you'll probably get one or two hours out of the experience, which for $2.59 Canadian or your regional equivalent is pretty great value. Depending on your sense of humour, you might get a few laughs from the game and the simplicity of the puzzles mean that you're never roadblocked on the journey for too long. It's short, sweet and somewhat disturbing experience. So with that in mind, my final rating for New The Beginning is Jenny out of 10. The weird kid in the corner that doesn't make very many friends but is pretty cool when you get to know them. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the end of the video! A massive thank you to the channel members on screen for supporting the channel and a special shout out to the very first Knight of the Holy Grail, Freaky Feline. If you'd like to become a member, you can do so for as little as a dollar per month. Just click the join button to see the available membership levels and perks. Check the description for a link to our community discord as well as a spreadsheet with all the games reviewed so far. Thank you for joining me on this weird gaming adventure through the depths of Steam and until next time, take care.